Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> good morning to you on the live stream. So glad you're joining us. Um, well, isn't this a uh, incredible venue? I mean, just let's take a moment just to digest this, this beautiful space that we're in. We have the Capitol in the background. It's a beautiful day. And, um, you know, the team did a wonderful job in putting this together. And we're just so uh, thrilled that you're here to, to participate and to be a part of it. I talked to a couple folks that came in from out of town, so we're grateful that you made the trip um, and to join this. Um, so um, I, before I go too far, I wanted to announce the, the restrooms are in the back uh, of the venue. Um, we want to make sure that we silence our cell phones if possible. Um, the the Wi-Fi is, uh, there's no password, so you can just log in. So I just wanted to cover those housekeeping items. Um, we, we, we have this venue because really it supported what we're trying to accomplish here and to model how to produce a virtual event or a hybrid event. Um, we have the monitors. We actually have the live stream behind you so, so you can get a sense of what the remote attendee experience is. Um, we have all these other monitors, and, and we have Jen Bukeri here, who's uh, our on-camera kind of MC for the virtual audience, and she's going to bring in their questions and comments. And so we're fortunate to have all, plan all of this. And as, as a presenters, we're presenting to you in person, but it's more responsibility on us to also engage that remote audience. Um, so, so that's something, as you plan these events, it's something we kept in mind and, and something for your own events to keep in mind. Um, so Jen, why don't we go ahead and welcome the virtual attendees in? Thank you, Rich, and welcome to the first Peak Boot Camp, uh, covering everything you need to know about putting on successful virtual events. My name is Jennifer Bocari, and I'm acting as your virtual moderator today. My goal is to actually bridge the gap between the presenters, the attendees, and the staff on site here at Spire with you who are joining us watching from your conference room or from your desk computer. Um, on the right side of the platform is our virtual engagement area and we really hope you use it a lot today. Uh, we want you to join us throughout all of our sessions by putting in your comments and your questions and I'm here to share that here in the room and to be, uh, you know, help that back and forth between the room and with you. Um, so again, join the conversation throughout the program. Uh, we'll be running some polls and other activities throughout our different sections, so watch out for those throughout the day. And I look forward to working with you today. So Rich, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. Great. Thanks, Jen. So um, nothing like a little pressure to live stream a program on live streaming, right? So, <laughs> so we really have to model uh, what we're doing. Um, so this is... Um, our boot camp on virtual events. Last year, uh, we had our, our user group meeting, our peak user group, and that primarily was around our, um, the users of our Elevate LMS and more holistically looking at education and, and helping our community, our clients, support how they're trying to evolve in many different ways around uh, professional development. We decided every other year we'd have an area focused on uh, a specific topic. And I know that for all of you, virtual events, ways of connecting with your community, being able to make yourself accessible, it's becoming more and more important. I, I was having some conversations before the program, and you're sharing with me how critical this is to you to be able to reach out and to be inclusive. And virtual events you know, are an obvious way to do that. Um, and virtual events are becoming more sophisticated, right? So our team, our, it's part of our culture and our history that we've been doing this for 20-some years. And from, so we have the landscape, we have the, 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 the viewpoint of where this all started and where we are now in its light years. So, so, so much has been done, not only in the technology that's available, but also the, the process and in making this part of a professional development strategy. I think initially it was more about that we're just trying to copy what's happening on site. Webinars were kind of sterile. They weren't like we were all together. Now we're doing much more to bring that remote audience in and thinking about really the responsibility of a shared goal with the presenters, the hosts, 
in this case, the venue, all of this fitting together to put this on so it's compelling and, compelling and engaging. And that's what this day is all about. So before I go too far, I wanted to thank our, our sponsor, Higher Logic. Um, we've enjoyed a two-year uh, partnership with Higher Logic. The whole goal is to bring community and learning together as one, to set up, you know, to, to prioritize social learning or peer-to-peer -peer engagement, and have that as a that element of uh, instructor-led training or instructor-led learning. So we're grateful for Higher Logic's participation. Please feel free to reach out to them. I think they have a booth in the back there and they'd love to talk to you. So we really appreciate their participation. So our schedule today, we're going to have our keynote, who I'll be introducing, Kiki Latalian. We're so thrilled to have Kiki join us, um, and I'll be introducing her in a moment. Then we're gonna have a session on virtual event design. How do you think about this creatively uh, and plan based on kind of core principles of professional development? Let the strategy kind of be your guide, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, we're gonna break for lunch, and then we'll uh, get into uh, the, the production aspect of virtual events. Our team members here will be sharing you their uh, advice and guidance, and then we're gonna talk about the economics. How do you generate a return on your investment uh, through these programs? Then we're gonna have a fun exercise at the end of the day. Uh, so retain kind of what we share and Kiki is going to uh, facilitate kind of a game format uh, on our last session. And then hopefully we can all enjoy a happy hour uh, and you can stay for that as well. And all of this is right here in this beautiful venue. We have access to the outdoors, so uh, enjoy the venue throughout the day. Um, I just wanna, uh, the, you know what goes into these events. And we had our first onsite user group meeting this, last year, this year, with this event, all that goes into planning, it's been, I would say, about a year uh, of getting ready for this. And I just want to acknowledge and thank our incredible team. They're all here today. Please feel free to reach out to them, connect with them. They're all involved in events and supporting events, and we're just so fortunate to have this group involved uh, in, in, in planning this, uh, this program. I also wanted to recognize our speakers today. Um, some, uh, like those, the National Association of Social Workers, Richard Loomis and Raphael Vitale, they're right in the building, so they appreciated that this is convenient for them. I was talking to this gentleman, Jim, Jim right? Yeah, so nice that you could just take the elevator up, right? Um, we did this for you, by the way. No. <laughs> um, Tanya Muse from the Council of Manufacturing Associations is going to be sharing her inspirational event that she did. She'll be here shortly. Of course, we have uh, Megan from our team and Aaron from the Consumer Bankers Association. Um, and then we have experts on monetization, Lewis Flax, and our production team, Jill and Brian, who they're both in action as well as going to be speaking. I don't know how you're gonna pull this off, Brian, but I'm sure you will. And then finally, um, our, our keynote speaker, uh, Kiki Latalian. So it's a, definitely a community effort and you're part of that community, so we appreciate sharing your ideas, your thoughts, Feel free at any time to ask questions and, and throughout the day, and hopefully we can address uh, all, all of your concerns or the challenges, address the challenges that you're facing. So now it's um, my pleasure to introduce Kiki. Um, the, the reason, one of the reasons we were so interested in having Kiki join us is she has been in the forefront of engaging associations for the past 17 years, I think we were talking about. So, and in many different roles. So she has a very unique perspective, both from a technology perspective, from social, um, community, professional development, and she's built this brand. And this, um, I think most of you probably are familiar with association chat. It's become the place where these conversations occur. So when there's developments within the community, they go to Kiki, and Kiki helps to facilitate those conversations. And so her events have become an extension of her brand and what she provides. And it's all based on the foundation of relationships. And so Kiki's going to share with us um, her strategy and kind of how that evolved. And hopefully from that, you can take some tidbits, some information, and, and for your own uh, community building efforts. 
So just to introduce, Kiki is the CEO and founder of Amplified Growth, a digital marketing consultancy specializing in podcasts, video marketing strategy, voice first SEO. I'm not sure I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> we can social, talk later. Okay. Social media, content strategy for associations and for profit. So again, we're all thrilled to have you here. Thanks oh, so thank much. You. And I'll turn the floor over to you. All right. I'm excited. So, I was 13 years old, and I hated community, or so I thought. My best friends from grade school had all decided that they would discard me, abandon me, as we went into middle school. And this was a horrible time to do this, because... It was awkward at home. My parents were going through this nasty divorce, and my life felt like it was falling apart. And oh, by the way, I know it's early this morning, but I'm going to go ahead and go there with all of you and allow myself to be vulnerable. At 13, I was hitting puberty. So I was a too tall girl with an unfortunate too short haircut. My life at home is falling apart. And to add insult to injury, the one person... I could depend on. The one person who thought I was special, who thought that I was pretty, who thought that I was smart, the one person who was my rock, my biggest fan in my life, my grandfather, died. It was a shitty year. It was the shittiest year. It was so horrible. And so I'm walking through these hallways and I am feeling awkward. I'm in a sea of uh, a bunch of awkward faces and I don't have anyone I can turn to. I don't know anywhere I can go for help. And without an anchor, an anchor of community, I feel lost and I don't have any hope of figuring it out. So I end up trying to fight against community. I don't want to make friends then. I don't need people. And what ends up happening is I end up finding other things. Ironically, I find myself with a group of people who are also damaged and hurt. And so we're all lonely loners together. And I, I needed community so much all at the same time while I hated it. Turns out that uh, it's a very human, natural need to need community. We all actually need to belong. We have this as part of our inner core of being human. And so it turns out in our brains, we have evolved to have the need to belong. So community is actually built in as something that's very, very important for everyone. It's a valuable asset that whether we like it or not, we actually have developed a need to belong. So I'm gonna to talk to you, I know it's, it's really crazy because at 10 a.m. I've already talked about puberty, uh, divorce, uh, dying, and now let's talk about something really gross, insect picking. So it turns out that humans and chimpanzees behaviorally are not that different. And in this wonderful Mind Valley talk by Eric Edmeads, he's a researcher that studies chimpanzees, he talks about this one activity that sort of has relevance for what we're talking about today. He talked about insect picking. And so specifically what happens, let me demonstrate, specifically what happens is the chimpanzees will line up in hierarchical order. And one chimpanzee will pick the ticks off of the chimpanzee above them, who ranks above them. So this is, I'm going to ask you to like make a jump with me here. So what happens to the chimp at the bottom? He doesn't get his ticks picked off, right? He's effectively shunned from the community. And guess what? The chimp at the bottom, those chimps, they tend to die out faster. 
So as humans, we've evolved. Um, thank God we're past picking ticks off of each other, although in southwest Missouri, where I'm from, who knows? Um, we've evolved, and we have evolved with this need to have small groups, small communities. So groups are meaningful. It's in us to, as, part of our, as part of our physiology, as part of our brain chemistry. In fact, you're watching me up here. And the truth is, is that there's this little part of you, most of you, hopefully all of you, um, that if I were to suffer shame or to have some sort of moment where I was shunned from the community in front of all of you, there's this little piece of you that activates, that triggers your empathy. And at least a small part of you would feel my pain. That's how linked we are to community. The idea of being separated from it forcefully not only would cause me pain, it would cause you pain. So if we take that and we think about it, OK, community is pretty important. Community has value. So what does community mean? Community can mean all kinds of things. Community can be a group of female entrepreneurs who are coming together, and they're all trying to accomplish the same thing. They pay to be part of this group, and they go in, and they're supporting each other's efforts. They are paying for resources. They are sharing the things that they fail at and the things that they win. It can mean that when a community that faces some horrible disaster, they may be fighting every single day up to that point, but when tragedy strikes, the community comes together, and suddenly it's like a family, all supporting. Community can also mean everything from uh, church to business, you know, from the soul to the pocketbook when we're looking at conversion. And what does that mean? It means that, you know, if you are a church, then you're aiming for saving souls and you're looking at butts and seats and souls in heaven. And if you have uh, a business, you're looking at your relationships and your conversations translating to sales. And all of this has relevance to our discussion talking about how do we build this? And I should know because I have the luxury of having a fantastic group, community, built all around associations with Association Chat. Now, I've been in associations for 17 years. Association Chat has been around for the past 10 years. It's a long time, buddy. <laughs> mm. OK, let me tell you about this. So Association Chat. Had, it started as a tweet chat. And it started happening every Tuesday at 2 p.m. People would show up. And the funny thing about it, it has the most pornographic, ooh, this is moving ahead of me. It has the most pornographic hashtag ever, ass and chat. I own it. Let's lean into that this morning, OK? Um, for the past 10 years, I've been living with this hashtag. OK. Um, it's a fantastic group. And so I have led over 500 discussions. I have collected this list of information about over 10,000 association professionals. And I've given over 200 live streamed interviews over the past three years. And so association chat has continued to grow. It's continued to evolve. And it's become so much to so many people. But it, while you could say that the growth has been organic, and it has been, it was not by accident. This didn't happen by accident. This was something that was purposefully put together. And over the years, I have had uh, the ability to see that people who have tried to create something similar have come and gone. Over the past 10 years, I see it. It happens every year. So what is it that works and what is it that doesn't about community? I've put together five elements of powerful community that I want to share with you guys today. I'm going to break it down one by one, go through some examples, get some examples from you, and we're all going to share together. 
And so hopefully you can apply this because the thing is, is that anything you're creating, whether it's a webinar series, whether it's a product to sell, it's only a transaction until you create a relationship out of it. If you think that community is some la la la, lighthearted, let's throw it to the intern kind of thing, you're thinking too small. So we're gonna talk about uh, the five elements of powerful community and then see where we can go from there. All right, so association chat. Tweet chat every Tuesday, 2 p.m. It was a lot of fun to begin with, but not something that was thought of as a community necessarily. We didn't have a platform online where people could communicate in between the chats. And so when you're thinking about people, and that's the first element that we're talking about today, people, you have to get really serious about who it is that's the perfect person, the perfect type of person to be part of your community. Seth Godin calls it people like me. He says in his book, Tribes, people like us do things like this. And so who are your people like us? Who is your people like me? So in the beginning, it was very clear who people like me would be because association chat started as a tweet chat only three years after Twitter was created. So uh, by default, the people who were involved in association chat were tech savvy, they knew about Twitter, they had to care about associations, they had to not care about a pornographic sounding hashtag, and they, and they had to know when it would be on every Tuesday at two, and they had to also know how to navigate a tweet chat, which to be honest, there are a lot of people sitting in this room, I bet, today, who don't know how to navigate a tweet chat. So let's just say that this very first group of people were very specific. And it was fantastic because then, like now, I could know something about my group. I knew that they were tech savvy. I knew that they were early adopters. I knew that they were people who cared about associations. And so to this day, I still create content that is going to feed that, that hardcore core, that initial core of who association chat people really were. But I talked to Peter. And Peter came up to me and he said, Kiki, I love what you're doing with association chat. I think it's so awesome. He said, I really wish I could participate, but I don't understand Twitter. And I don't have time to learn. And there were more and more people like Peter. And so I had to think, like, there's this great thing that's going, but I need to find a channel for the group that's more inclusive, that's more intuitive. And so I started looking at, you know, what channel would make sense? What channel would make sense so that um, more people could participate? And so the lesson with people, when you're looking at the first element, the lesson with people is ha take a hard look at who are your core people and figure out the easiest way for them to participate. Make that connection for them simple. All right, I wanna talk to you about shared experience. So as association chat continued to grow, the big industry meeting for associations, it was ASAE's uh, annual, was coming up, and I got a call from Terry. Now, there were people, there were people who would pop in and out for conversations that they were interested in occasionally, um, you know, if it hit their fancy. It was an area that they were, in particular, interested in. But then there were the regulars. And actually, if you want to know the truth, there are cycles. There are, like, at this point, I can say there are classes of different individuals who every Tuesday they show up religiously. So in this first round of regulars, Terry was one of them. And she called me up and she said, Kiki, oh my gosh, AZ annual's coming up and we have to get together. 
all of us who see each other all the time need to, need to meet in person. What are you going to do? And I'm like, uh, oh, we're going to meet? We're going to have a meetup. And so we met. And we did have the meetup. And as a matter of fact, people knew each other so well. They created these relationships so well online that they were greeting each other by their Twitter handles. In fact, for years, I thought Terry's last name was Tally. Turns out she's just from Tallahassee. And so it was actually not her name, but part of, part of her Twitter handle. And so the people met there. And it turned out they knew so much about each other because they connected online but they're actually meeting in person. And what I want to drive home is this. I mean, we know that face-to-face can have a lot of value. And if you create a community and they build and build and build, it's natural to want to have meetups and, and move in that direction. That's definitely something I would encourage you to do. It's fantastic to sort of cement those relationships. But then you also should probably consider that a lot of those people weren't at ASA annual, and they have continued to forge and develop those relationships. And it's entirely possible to have very meaningful, high-level, important uh, relationships with people you only meet online. So the lesson for shared experience, and I'll give you some more examples in a little bit, the lesson for shared ex- experience is that you need to provide a way for people to have them. You know, in my case, I started out with a tweet chat that was once a week. But it wasn't until I provided a way, an online community, a way for them to continue to talk about it, take the conversation and continue the conversation to build on those relationships, that I saw the growth hockey stick It totally transformed in reach. And that was because there was this ability to connect in between. All right. Shared purpose is our third element. A shared purpose is so important for people because in a time when you are looking at, why should I pay attention to this? How does this cut through the noise for me? You know? Some of you may be creating stuff that you don't know why somebody should care necessarily about this one thing, but you need to think deeply about the people you're reaching out to and why they should care. What is it that they're ultimately trying to do? Now, I'm not going to pretend that at the beginning I I figured this out. Like This was something that I did at the beginning with association chat. But one thing is for sure, in associations, You can pretty much depend that when you go to visit your family during the holidays, that like no one in your family is going to know what the hell an association is. For association professionals, you know, we're so used to people not understanding what we do that to be able to connect with other people who can relate and who are still struggling with the same kind of issues, this was a driving purpose. It was something that people connected with each other about. We were already a tribe before we even started. And all it took, and this is the lesson, all it took was to realize that. You want to call to attention whatever it is that you're creating, how that community is a community. A lot of times you don't know why, who else is on the webinar, who else is Who else is here? You're not thinking about the other people necessarily who are participating with you. But the strength is an understanding that you're already in a tribe and then connecting with those people there and understanding you have a shared purpose. Okay, so let's talk about resources. Resources is the fourth element. And by resources, this is all going back to that community, that reason that we need community. And that is that at a core level, we need to belong. And the community provides us what? It provides us the ability to survive. You know, back in the day, you know, if we survived, 
hopefully we would have a community, there was the ability to access resources so that we could survive and thrive. We could procreate, we could like, we could live. It meant life. So yeah, survival has changed a little bit. Now we're just thinking, eh, if I can catch an Uber and get home, I'm good. But we still have this need to figure out, is this worth my time? Is this thing that I'm paying attention to? Is this, is this community worth my time? And so part of that is understanding what is it that you're providing that's a resource that has any necessity for the people that you're providing it to. The people like me, you know, they need to know what's coming. They need to be thinking on the forefront of every industry. If there's an association for every industry, an association for everything, there's an association for associations, well then people like me care about figuring out how to be on the forefront of their industry. They care about figuring out how to make better decisions. They care about figuring out how to reach people better. They care about things like behavior, human behavior, and what would make them care, you know? So for people like me, resources like this, these weekly chats, are critical because I need to know. I need to see things and hear about things that I can't see or hear anywhere else. And that's what association chat provides. OK, and let's talk about the fifth element. <laughs> It's not, that, uh, it's not that movie, and it's not, <laughs> the fifth element is always the coolest element, and actually in this case it really is. This is the most important element, and that's trust. And here is what I haven't talked about to this point. Um, I need a drink, it's so parched. Mm. Okay, here's what I haven't talked about to this point. Most people don't think about business as being personal. They try to keep things very, very separate. And trust seems like something that's a nice to have, but not a necessity. If you look at where trust is on the world stage right now, we're critically low, okay? Trust in organizations right now, not great. Trust in politics, not great. Trust in institutions, not great. If you think you have your members or your uh, you know, customers' trust, I challenge you to tell me why. Why do you assume that? Why do you think you do? Because I'm telling you that in an age where things have become so transactional, if you're assuming anything, if you're assuming trust, though, then I would ask that you maybe take another look at that. Trust is critical if you want to build big things. And so if you have this desire to create something that's meaningful and valuable around a brand, this is a very important element. This is probably the most important element. Now, could you create a community with fewer than these five elements? Absolutely, you totally could. But could you create a powerful community that's loyal? Could you create a powerful community that can lead movements? Could you create a powerful community that's going to buy what you're selling every time? And the answer is, <laughs> I don't know why this is going ahead without me. Okay, and the answer is no. You need all five elements to create a powerful community that's going to last. And so trust is a tough one, though. Trust, I admit it. You know, you can't buy trust. It's not that easy. And so how do you do it? How do you go about it? What are the things that you can do to try to instill trustworthiness, to, to present trustworthiness to people and get across that, yeah, you can, you can talk to me. You can communicate with me. My brand, this is worth your time. You're going to get real talk here. Now, I don't know how well you know association chat or if you've participated in any of the discussions, but this element is so important. This is what has led 
to conversations that are difficult that cannot be talked about anywhere else. This is what led me to interview John Graham about alleged, uh, you know, intellectual property issues and plagiarism. And this is not a small thing, you guys. To build trust means that you have a group of people who are saying, yeah, I can back you up. I will listen to what you're saying. I trust you to tell me what's going on. I trust your advice. And so I think you got it. Trust is important. OK. So let's talk about these five elements, going through some examples. Because I want you to be thinking about how, how you can apply them. Hopefully, some of you have been out there thinking, huh, this webinar series, how am I building in a chance for people to communicate in between? Or, hey, this online course I'm doing, where is it that I am really thinking about who it is that's coming to it and how I can best provide value to them? How is this an important resource? Where's the shared experience in this? I mean, we have Jen over here who is talking with people online and making sure that they're having this shared experience, even if they're not sitting in this room. We are having the shared experience. The people online are having the shared experience. And we're working on that. So let's talk about people once again. Now, Tuesday, I had this fantastic interview with Radha Agrawal. Radha Agrawal is a creator of a series called Daybreaker. Daybreaker started out in New York. And it's, I mean, this is not for everyone. But during the week, at 7 AM in the morning, people come together. It's a sober event, but it's like a rave during the week at 7 in the morning with live music, dancers. There's acro yoga. yoga. There's like, I mean, it's crazy. I've been there. And I had her on. She, she created this book called Belong. She's also a social entrepreneur. Just really incredible. This is spread to uh, cities across the world. And so she had something to say. I wasn't planning on including this in the talk, by the way. But on Tuesday, she said this perfect thing. She had this thing to say about how they were very specific in the very beginning about the people who were going to be part of Daybreaker. Okay, let's see if it goes on. It worked earlier. Um, physically, the experience would, would not have been right, and it would not be the movement that it is today. We would not have 500,000 people in our community today if we didn't take the time at the very, very early onset, the very first event, before I even opened our doors, my co-founder and I, we sat down and we debated over two days, 300 names that we would invite to the very first event. And we said, and it didn't have to be all like, yay, like dance party people. It, it needed to be people who are chill, relaxed, fun, but also joyful, right. fun. Yeah. So two days agonizing over the first 300 names. She went on to say, she was like, oh, and we didn't want just like rah, rah, dance people. We wanted people who had the right kind of spirit, who were going to be able to go and be supportive of it so that those people who were maybe a little more reticent to participate or those people who were waiting and watching on the side, that the right people who were behind it were out there saying, no, no, come on in, the water's fine. And so, I mean, what if we actually took a little bit of time to really consider who are the perfect people, not just to participate in whatever it is that we're creating, but also who are the right people to talk about it? Who are the right supporters who are out there? How are we building this out on purpose? All right, so then part of that, for me, I've got to tell you a little bit of story. This is actually, <laughs> this is actually at the Why Associations Matter event that um, it's a part of a project. And the very first event just took place at the end of March. And I got 14 different people in the association industry to share why associations matter. Because why? Because they do. And if one in three people are somehow connected to an association, it's a pretty big deal. And yet, most people, when we talk to them, when we meet with them, and our families don't necessarily, even if they belong to one, really understand there's an industry there, what associations are and why they matter. So I wanted to get, I wanted to get in people's own words, you know, why associations matter. 
<clears throat> and so 14 people came, they got their headshots, and I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to really dig in and test what I know about my people, but then also, also to go in and, and challenge some of these assumptions. So all the time I've got different ideas of things that I want to try. I talked with Rich earlier about like a few of them that are going to happen. There are also some that never do happen. And the reason why is because not every idea is a good one. One idea I really loved was this idea of a subscription box. So that's of the cha-cha or the, uh, the Y Associations Matter event. Cha-cha. Okay, cha-cha was this brilliant idea. I'm like designing this for the people. It's a subscription box for association professionals. Creativity hacks for associations. So cha-cha, right? I thought this was clever. Had my little logo made. I'm like ready to, to sell. I did research on subscription box industry. Like I did research on pricing. I got somebody to help me with sourcing. I started thinking about how this is going to work with uh, if you have individuals receiving the box for professional and personal advancement, development, versus industries where they are bringing it in as a team, right? Like the, the organizations will be bringing it in and sharing it with their team. So it offer like a box for team facilitation. Every, every box would have a book, which would be tied to an online book club where people could talk, generate ideas. Every box, and I thought about this, okay, guys, I'm thinking, what do associations have tons of? Resources. We have so many resources, and yet, and like books, and, and white papers, and work, workbooks, and all this stuff. And I thought, what if, you know, we created this way to get into people's office, to have a tangible benefit, talk about perceived value, I would be right there with them. It would be association chat, and there would be like, association chat stickers, and there would be you know, a, a checklist of how to prepare your lighting so you look better on your next webinar that you could keep next to your computer. I thought about this stuff, and I was really, really excited. I thought every association could do this. And then maybe they would reach out to me. They'd be like, how did you do this, Kiki? And I could come in with my team. We would be hired. It would be, it would be beautiful. And I'm off to the races, right? My mind, I'm like loving this idea. <clears throat> so, we have the Y Associations Matter project. People come in and they're getting their photos and a friend of mine who's this just awesome uh, marketer but she doesn't do anything with uh, associations. I had her come in and I said, after they meet and they share their stories and they get their headshots, I want to just collect some information about how they feel about association chat, like the, the, how they feel about the resources, where are they getting the most value out of, and I'm going to have this prototype of the box. And I'm going to have them check it out. They can feel it, touch it, tell us what they think. So they're doing it, and all throughout the day, I'm like in the spirit of the moment, and I'm running around, and I'm so excited because I'm like, you know, my people are here, and they're going through, and they're getting their headshots, and they're sharing why associations matter, and oh, it's so great. And later, <clears throat> we break for lunch, and Becky, my friend who is the brilliant marketer, she comes over and she says, Kiki, oh my gosh, I have the best News, we've, we've been getting amazing feedback. She said, people love this idea of having a book club. She said, they are so for it. There was one person that wasn't, but basically everybody else is like, yes, we want a book club. They have ideas about how it could happen. And, and Kiki, lo people love what you're doing with association chat. They think it's amazing. And they want to see more. And oh, yeah, but um, and I'm loving this. I'm eating it up. I'm like, I'm brilliant, and association chat's awesome. And then she says, oh, yeah, but Kiki, um, no one wants a subscription box. I'm like, oh, my god, no, no. But I mean, I, I like to think that I was standing there and I was more like, mm-hmm. But, um, but inside, I'm dying. Because like all this time, I mean, I talk to people. I've gotten, I had people who said that they're willing to buy the first box, but they were supporting me. They were supporting my efforts. They were not giving me the honest feedback, which is, I don't really want a box. Don't want it. And so, even though it hurt, it was the most valuable information I could have gotten. 
And that is why I want to, I want to reinstill in you that this, this, this point about focusing on people, every time there's a marketing session, you know, I've given dozens of them where I'm saying people is the first part of the post methodology, people, objective. I mean, I can tell you people, it's always starting with the people, but there's a reason why. And the reason why is because if you don't spend enough time there, even if you know your people really well, you can still get it wrong. So test your assumptions, especially if you're excited about them. All right. Second element, the shared experience. I'm going to give you a chance to talk to each other in a sec. That'll be your shared experience. But, uh, but I want to talk about shared experience because when I worked for an association that was focused on the science of optics, I was put in the position of needing to create an experience for student chapter leaders. These student chapters were comprised of um, grad students who were older than I was at the time, right? And I did not have much of a budget. So when I pose the problem to you of how do you get a bunch of professionals together who don't know each other very well um, to loosen up and begin to talk to each other, I'm sure I, I heard like a little bit of laughter. You're already solving the problem the same way I would have liked to, which is alcohol, right? Alcohol, <laughs> especially with grad students, yeah. Okay, so my budget though, not, not matching that answer, okay? So what I did instead was I decided that I had to figure out a way to bond them as a group, have this shared experience, without being able to get them plastered first. And so I thought, man, I am limited on what I'm able to do. How am I going to do it? I'm going to need music. I'm going to need surprise. I'm going to need a shared risk. A shared risk, preferably given early on. OK, so shared risk. What is that? It has to be safe, a safe enough risk that people will do but something that they almost have to do. What could that be? OK, and so I went online, and I got the tackiest, ugliest, animal print, cheap hats from Oriental Trading Company. I'll go ahead and give them some business. <laughs> no dog on this show. Don't want it. Uh, but Oriental Trading Company and got just massive amounts of these ugly, tacky hats. I had space. I was given space. So I didn't have to worry about that. So with my little mini budget, I decided, OK, here's, here's the thing. To get on the shuttle, to go to the space, they have to wear the hat. That's how they're going to know each other. That's part of entry. They have to wear the hat. So immediately, the small risk is, OK, I don't have to worry about looking stupid. Kiki has taken that off the table. We are all going to look stupid together. So we're all wearing the tacky hats in order to access the event. OK, so I also needed the surprise, right? And so, and the music, key. So we were in Arizona. And I was looking for someone who could come in and on their feet, like run through when nobody was expecting it. And mariachi band, all right? So the idea was, you know, like people would be in there and then all of a sudden, 30 minutes into it, they think it's just like every other reception and in comes the mariachi band and they're dancing through and they're like having a great time and people are like, I'm in this dumb hat and now there's a band that's walking through, and I had no idea that any of this was going to happen. All of this was designed to create something remarkable and memorable. Now, I understand that we can't have a mariachi band go in the middle of our webinars, our online courses. I mean, we could, but it's not very practical, right? And so, um, with shared experience, what you have to start thinking is, how can I create a shared experience that's going to be remarkable and memorable? This is not going to be like every other webinar I've been on. This is not going to be, how can you engage them? How can you make it so that they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know who Holly241 is, but Holly, oh my gosh, what just happened on here? 
There has to be something that makes it stand out so that they remember. So they're like, we shared a moment. Have you ever been stuck in an elevator and it's like, like a long time and you end up sharing things with people, like complete strangers, and you're like, God, now I feel like we have to exchange like Christmas cards. I don't know. Um, at the end of it, if you've ever been in that situation, you've had a shared experience. And strangers can totally bond over one event. So you're trying to create a shared experience. I'm going to ask you to create a shared experience now. The mariachi band is not going to come through here right now. <laughs> but what I want you to do is I want you to answer this question. I want you to think, when was the first time you felt like you really belonged? The first time you really felt like you really belonged. You may have never thought about this question before. But just go with the thing you feel safe with sharing with someone. And I want you to look around and find someone you don't know very well. This is always a part where the kid in the back of the room, I was the kid in the back of the room for a while, remember? I was the one that was like with the other loners that didn't want to connect. This is where I'm rolling my eyes inside. But it's OK. Let's work through it. Um, find somebody you don't know very well. And I want you to go and connect with them and share the first time you felt like you really belonged. You have only four minutes, and then the mariachi band will play. All right, four minutes. Find somebody. Thanks, everybody. Let's come back. <laughs> I'm not a dancer. That's my daughter. OK. So, so did you learn something new about somebody you, you didn't know very well before? Did you learn anything that was meaningful? Anybody want to share? Volunteers. Please, come on, somebody. Did we have, oh, right up here. Yay, yay, yay. I'll share yours. OK. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's so the remote. All right. Okay, uh, so I guess in we were both we're both around the same age, so we connected around college, and so I shared that in middle school and high school I was not the most popular kid. Um, I was obsessed with band, so and I got my first job right at sixteen. So while everyone was doing actual fun stuff every Friday, Saturday night from six to eleven, I was at Blockbuster Video in Springfield. <laughs> so for anybody that grew up in the Saratoga Newport News or no. Uh, <laughs> Newington Station area. You probably saw me at 16 on a Friday night at Blockbuster Video um, doing more fun stuff than clearly I was doing. Um, and yeah, so then once I got to college, though, it was like, wow, no, I'm not going to school with the same people I went to high school or middle school with because when you go to Catholic school, you know the same people from kindergarten to 12th grade. Like everyone goes to the same school, similar to public school, I imagine, but you kind of split off eventually. And uh, going to college, like, I didn't really know anybody. It's like, wow, I'm starting from scratch. Like, I'm not at the wow. bottom of the social ladder anymore. Like, I know everybody. I work at the gym. Everyone knows me. And it was yeah. just kind of an enlightening experience. Like, wow, people actually, like, we all want to hang out together. So, Oh, that's so cool. I love that story. Um, thank you. And actually, could someone hand her this? Because I don't want to get in front of the speakers and cause people's ears to hurt with this. Thank you for volunteering and being brave. Um, do we have, actually, Jen, do we have somebody from online that wants to share? We do. Lots of responses. Uh, my first time was camping as a young child. None of my siblings wanted to sleep outside, so I slept outside with the dog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> another, neighbor, another neighbor kid was doing the same, and I Aww. remember thinking, other people don't understand how good it could be uh, to be like us. Um, another one saying, first time was uh, joining a sorority. Friendships have lasted a I lifetime. Um, another one commenting, uh, I felt like I really belonged when I uh, organized our neighborhood to fight a mining operation. Wow. Shared wow. goals. And see, it's people uniting over a cause. It's people sharing a shared experience of camping in the backyard and... They were both being rebels together. It's so, so amazing. And yet, inside, do you feel what that feels like? You hear these stories, and it's like there's a very human response to that that's like, 
Yeah, yeah. United we stand, divided we fall, right? It's like all through and through, we have this. And so this desire to belong is very powerful. And it's something that we can, we can look for ways to bring people in and make whatever it is that we create more meaningful and powerful by figuring out how to supply that, how do we feed that sense of belonging that people really desperately need today. Whew, <laughs> breath. Um, so yeah, let's talk about purpose. <clears throat> so shared purpose, it sounds very weighty. It sounds very, um, oh my gosh, the shared purpose, we wanna change the world. Um, but a shared purpose can mean that it's as simple as we all kind of want the same things. Uh, why associations matter is a really good example of how this can evolve over time. The shared purpose with association chat was always, we're a group of people who all belong in associations, in the association community, we work in associations, and we want to support one another. We want to understand and, and network with one another. And that was really the driving purpose in the beginning. And as I turned the tweet chat into this interview series, because it's incredibly difficult to talk about the ins and outs of LMSs, AMSs, and membership models in 140 characters or less, which is what Twitter was at the time, um, you know, we went into this interview series. And I still, you know, wanted to have this engagement. That's why it was so important that uh, there be a way for people to engage live every week, even if it wasn't the same kind of format. What I realized later was that, gosh, even with this online community, I feel like there's something, I feel like there's something else, you know? This isn't about a show. It's wrong to just call it a podcast. It's a community, and as a community, we're all driving toward what together? We're all able to do, so Why Associations Matter was a project that I wanted people to become a part of, to begin to spread the word, to serve as almost an online yearbook, where people, for a moment in time, could add their two cents about why associations matter and forever be part of a greater community. I started having dreams about taking this to other places, not just in the DC area, but to other hotbeds for associations and collecting people's stories so that we had this ongoing quilt, this tapestry of what it is to be a part of this community. So this movement is really part of this underlying drive to make sure that there's always an online place for people to go, no matter how much money they have, no matter what their role is, no matter where they're located in the world, if they work in associations, there's an online place for free that they can become a part of the community. It's always gonna be there. And that ability to have honest, open dialogue means that my role is not exactly just leader or ambassador. I'm a protector of open, honest dialogue. That's my role. What your role is for your community is to be able to show them how they're connected and how they can identify that purpose too in whatever it is that you're creating. Okay, resources. <clears throat> so for resources, what I learned is that it's more than just thinking about uh, you know, supplying what I think people need and what they've said that they need. It's this ongoing question of being curious and asking why. You know, um, The hive mind topic, figuring out how people make decisions. I'm always forever testing to find out, is this something that is going to be of interest in the future? potentially really super important for people in order to do what they do in this particular community. And that is the answer to the question of what's a, what's a resource for association chat. For you, the answer may be something different, but it's forever asking why. Why would people care? <clears throat> why would this matter? And the closer you can get to saying, this is really important because if you're missing out on this conversation, if you're missing out on this community, you're really missing out. Like, this, this is something you need. And then trust. All right. We're nearing, 
we're nearing this part where we're going to talk a little bit more about trust. Because trust is tricky, isn't it? It is. How do you fast track trust? Can you even fast track trust? Is that even possible? What do you think? I don't know. I don't know. I know. It's so hard. Thing is, is that you can. It's a really bizarre answer, and it's totally true. You can fast track trust. So what I'm going to share with you is really important, and it fits in to these five elements of powerful community. We're going to talk about how to fast track trust but I'm going to put you on the spot one more time before we do. All in the name of shared experience, OK? All right, so I want to test you on this. <clears throat> and you might even get a fancy schmancy association chat mug if you're brave enough to participate. So OK, let's talk about people. And let's actually, let's, let's talk about this event right here. Let's talk about you're here. You're here for a reason. If you were responsible for building out a community around this event today, and comm partners, you guys can listen, but you can't actually supply the answers because you've already thought about this. If you were responsible for identifying how to build out the community around this today, what are some of the things that you would do? What are some of the things that you would try? You know, where would you go? What would be some of the first things that you would, you would be thinking about uh, doing to try to figure this out? Does so anybody want to volunteer? I can pick on people, but you don't want that. Do you? Do you? <laughs> yes. So we have starting with a nice reception and giving yourself, giving people a chance to sit down, introduce yourselves, and get to know each other. Thank you. What's your name? Lena, Lena, yay. We're going to figure out this whole mug transaction thing. I want this to be more than a transactional relationship. But for now, here's a mug. Um, yeah, figuring out a way to have like a chance for people to get to know each other. What if, what if, so what if people show up late? What if they're like, oh, I don't know that I want to network beforehand. I don't know. How, how could you even get people here in the first place where it's like, this is where I belong? Anyone? How would they know? One yes. second. Coming over your way. OK. Information about each of the attendees in advance, just so you can see who's attending, what Ooh. what they're like, um, other yes. societies that are attending. I love it when I love it when these things happen. That's a, and what's your name? Shannon Peterson. Shannon Peterson. That's a that's a good one too. Um, I love it when this happens because I can kind of game plan. It's not even like I'm that strategic when I get there, but it makes me curious. It makes me think about. Oh, if I do end up meeting, that person sounds interesting. I have something I could ask them, and I feel better prepared. And actually, you guys, this is like a false sense of security, because I don't know if you're like me. I mean, I talk about false sense of security. I have all of my slides printed out up here, a word for word transcript. This is my script that's 21 pages of what we're talking about today. I have flashcards. And I'm not using any of them. So I totally believe in the ability to feel prepared ahead of time. I love it when events do this sort of thing, because I feel like I can start to identify who it is that I might see, the type of conversations we might have, and I won't feel like I'm struggling all the time for something to say. Um, great examples. Let's talk a little bit. Um, I want one more example, and we're going to get you a mug, too. So I'm, I'm running out of mugs. Um, one more example, which is let's talk about how can you help people to have a shared experience online when you don't have a mariachi band? What are some other ideas about doing something that makes something remarkable and memorable? Anyone? Any online? Actually, online, virtual, you guys can answer this too. Um, 
although the mug would be a harder thing to get to you, but. <laughs> examples, yes. Shared experience. You could ask them about a shared experience uh -huh. so that they have something that bonds them and gets them talking. They don't have to come up with oh, ways to. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> something that gets them talking. I mean, really, anything that gets people communicating to each other rather than just feeding back to you, right? And so, and, and that's actually what I want to get to because it is so important to be thinking constantly about. I'm much more successful at the end of this if you guys are, are thinking how you can apply it and bring people together, which is my ultimate goal, how you guys can apply this and bring this together, these things for your people, and maybe help each other out than if you're just trying to feed back to me because what am I going to do? No, it's these relationships you can form here that has the power, right? So, um, and this is just a really fantastic shot to remind me that I needed to hand out the mugs if I didn't already. By the way, you guys, I like, I did this thing at the very beginning of the year where I decided just to be healthier and to be totally focused. I was gonna do like sober January, and then it's like, I'm gonna do the whole sober, like I'm not gonna drink for all of 2019 which in the association industry is very difficult because there's nothing but receptions. And, uh, and this is day 100 of 2019. Yeah, celebrate, shared experience on that. Okay, so I have to ask you now, do you trust me? Do you trust me? <laughs> do you trust the person sitting next to you? If you were running this event, wouldn't you want them to? Wouldn't you want people to be feeling safe and like they're able to be a little bit more vulnerable? And so what I just shared, which is kind of personal, could be a negative. You know, somebody could take this information about me choosing not to drink and, and you know, like making that a thing that's negative. That's me being vulnerable up here. And, and it could have gone, like, that could be a bad thing, but you probably feel a little safer about me because I'm willing to put that out there. That's not to say that you're supposed to air all your dirty laundry or share anything, but what that is to say is that understanding how you can maybe have some safe risks and maybe share and make yourself a little bit vulnerable might help connect the people that you're trying to connect. All right, so fast-tracking trust, because I know you guys might have some questions that you have for me. Fast-tracking trust. There are three ways you can fast-track trust. There are more, there's a little bit more than that. We could talk about trust signals and things like that, which has to do with like, you know, dressing up as a, a police officer or something like that. We're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about things you can apply. Fast-tracking trust, consistency is the first key to that, consistency. And what that means is that you are showing up. Yes, you're doing the thing that you say you're going to do, you're doing it regularly, and people begin to trust that, why? Well, because you're showing up and doing what you say you're gonna do, yes, but on a very simple level, our brains identify patterns of behavior. And when we see something happening over and over and over again, our brains say we can trust in that to happen yet again we begin to associate trustworthiness or trust in that behavior with that thing or person. So when you're looking at how to fast track trust, one quick way you can do that is to figure out what can you say you're gonna do and then do consistently and, and the, fa like the faster you can do it, that's why when you're showing up and you're saying, we have a new blog, and you do it, and you, you actually make it so that it's like a daily blog or something, people start to think, wow, I can, I can imagine that uh, that person's going to do what they say they're going to do. My God, they write a blog post every day, you know, that you see the pattern. Okay, intention. Have you ever been part of a group 
where you think that it's all going to be fun, you guys are working on things, and then a sale, like somebody tries to do the MLM, multi-level marketing, somebody's like, you know, let's become friends, and oh, by the way, let me share with you my new everlasting lipstick or something like that. And, um, and it's like, you know, you get, you get in that experience, but you kind of know as you're heading down that path, there's this moment, there's this turn, there's this... There's this moment in the conversation, and I'm sorry, if anybody sells that, it is great stuff, I have to say. I, I bought it. <laughs> it's great. I'm not going to become a salesperson, but thank you. Um, but there's this moment in the conversation where it kind of, you know, you know the, the sale is coming, and you might feel betrayed, if you're really honest. You might feel betrayed. You might feel like, this happened to me several times, oh, it's another... Mom, she seems cool. We're going to become friends. I'm not selling Rodan and Fields. This was the pattern. Like, this is how it went. And, and it's like, it's such a disappointment because you want to belong. We do. We know this. We've established this by now. You want to belong. And when somebody's intentions are false, right? You, you think that their motivation, that their intention is one thing, and then it turns out to be something else. You feel what? Betrayed, right? That's exactly what happens to so many of our communities. We go in and we say, we're going to create this community and everybody can feel welcome and, and it's all open and this is just in the name of community and goodwill. And then the, the subtle sale. And here's the thing that people get wrong about this. You can totally sell to your community. You can sell to your community, and it's fine. You just can't be underhanded about it. Don't be dishonest, and don't be slick like you think you're going to get by with something. Don't pretend like you care when you don't. What you do is you're straightforward about it. People understand how business works. They understand that it takes something to keep the lights on. You're not selling out by, by trying to make money, right? I think that we can all agree that we understand that for a community to work, there, somebody has to be paying for something somewhere. So it's not like selling's a bad thing, but where people go wrong so often, you guys, I'm not kidding, where people go wrong is where they try to be slick about it and underhanded about it and ask questions that you can tell they don't really care. They're asking so it leads into their sales funnel, so it goes down that path. And I'm going to warn you that before you get too crafty, I know we have all kinds of technologies to help us with this, before you get too crafty, you need to get real, real, because we have all grown up in an age where we can sense this stuff from miles away. And to pretend like we're smarter you know, than somebody else, that they're not going to see it. They're never going to tell you. The person will never tell you. I never told the Rodan and Fields lady, I feel betrayed. I feel like I can't trust you. I feel like, you know, we were going to be friends and now I'm disappointed and I'm terribly disappointed. And although our daughters are friends, I'm never going to, I never had that conversation with her. And the community that I, that I left because they were being dishonest about their intentions, never had that conversation with them either. I just didn't go again. I just didn't show up. So why do these communities fail when we try to start them? It's because we're dishonest. It's because we're, we're lacking one of these five elements. So we always have to put that first. All right, interaction, fast-tracking trust, interaction. Even if people are jerks, you have to figure out how to behave diplomatically in your groups. If you turn on the snark, it very rarely works. Interactions should always require that when you're interacting with people online, that you're holding yourself to a higher standard because other people are too, okay? And so I've had it where people have been totally, I mean, it doesn't happen often, but it happens, where people have been just dogs, you know? And it's like, you need to rise above it and remember that as protector of your community, as like you're sort of overseeing it, you treat people with respect and try to 
present the best version of who you are, and also have your policies and rules in place that you can refer to if things go really off the rails. All right, three ways to fast track trust. So, Lil Kiki was so sad and she was lonely. And turns out that as I got older, I ended up creating communities when I was in college, live poet society. Then I go into associations and I become a chapter manager and I begin creating chapters for my associations all over the world. And it turns out that little Kiki, who hated communities, uh, ended up spending her pretty much her entire rest of her life building communities. And today, I stand before you and say that, you know, when I talk to you about community, I hold it to a higher standard now and respect it now in a way I never did before. And aside from association chat, one of my most important communities that I'm a part of today is actually one that I was invited to only last year. And a woman invited me to be a part of it. It was part of a group. This is, this is little Kiki. I, I avoided cameras, too, when I was 13. So I have, unfortunately, like no photos of myself at 13. This is me at 17. My hair had grown out by that point. And uh, I still have that sort of I don't trust you look in my eye, but it's the closest I could get. And then this is today with some of the friends that I have in this group. And we go out and we explore. And the, the reason we were all pulled in together was because we have this desire to learn about human behavior, to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We're all entrepreneurs, but we're all interested in becoming better humans. And so we get together and we talk about kind of some woo-woo stuff where it's like, how do we raise our energy to a higher level? How do we become better human beings? Okay. I know I'm revealing a lot here. So at the last uh, meeting, we have these in-person meetings, our shared experiences, and we take turns teaching each other. We take turns talking about different topics. In our last meeting, Nancy, who was the one who brought us all together, she gave us this question to take with us. And she said, who will you be when you're done being who you think you are? That's kind of the look I had, too. I was like, what? Um, and it's, it's this tantalizing question that's like, we have these assumptions, we have these habits, we have this path that we're walking. But who will we be when we're done being who we think we are? And so what I want you to do is I want you to think about who you are now. And I want you to think about one lesson or one thing you want to do, action you want to take within the next month, thinking about the five elements of building powerful community, thinking about the types of content that you're creating online, thinking about even getting more intentional about the relationships you might have in your own life. What is one thing you're going to do from the information that you learned here today? And I want you to write it down on the back of your card. I had these specially printed for today so that they should be easy to write on. Tell me if they're not. I want you to write your name down. And I want you to write an email address where you don't mind where somebody's going to reach out to you. People virtually, I understand that you don't have the card in front of you, but all of the rules apply. You can share this information online because once you write this down, what I would really like for you to do is to share it with your belong buddy, with your accountability buddy, the person that you shared this meaningful conversation with earlier about when was the first time you felt like you belonged. Write down your information, and I want you to write down the date at the bottom as being a month from today. That's what, May 11th? Yes, May 11th, I think. Okay. May 11th. And in a month from now, and it'd be awesome if you put this in your calendars right now. In a month from now, I want you to email each other and check in. And see, did you do it? <laughs> did you do the thing? All right. 
Once you have those things written down, I want you to exchange your cards. I want you to remember that you always remember, support, and protect who or what helps you belong. We're going to open up for questions. We have a little bit of Q&A time, I think. Quite, yes. Hello. Um, Hi. Scott Harris from the Council for Advanced and Supportive Education. We're a membership association. Um, the biggest thing that I would love to know your thoughts are on is how do you create a community of trust when people who are coming into this community, maybe their schools or higher education institutes or companies, currently don't have the greatest uh, trust or um, no, in the community as a whole. Yes. This is such an important part because you might be having, you know, you might have all kinds of different situations of people that you're connected to or organizations that you're connected to where you don't have control over their actions, but you have control over yours. And I think raising that, that conversation and actually acknowledging it, saying, Look, trust is inc it's incredibly important. There's no, there is no one, I don't think, in association chat who, if the subject of trust came up and we talked about it, would ever doubt that, that I hold it to the highest. Like I, that is a trait, that is a characteristic of association chat that is sacred, sacred and part of what it is. And I think any organization who maybe that's an issue and there are a lot of them out there because a lot of our institutions are under fire right now, um, some for good reason and some not, you know. Um, when trust is at such a low, all you can do is try to improve your trustworthiness. All you can do is communicate with intention and, and do the very best job you can do, you know, to actually embody that trustworthiness and to show, like, this is who we are. Transparency is a tough topic because people will talk about authenticity and transparency like um, we're supposed to reveal everything about everything. And that's not at all the case. There are some good reasons why you wouldn't share your bank balance and every itemized like thing, the, the details. But the point is that you're communicating with clarity. You're communicating the message. You're not willingly, knowingly being dishonest, and you're communicating what people need to know. And I think that when you put yourself forward and your organization forward, and, and you show that that is something that is of the utmost importance, people get it. They get it. Does anybody else have, have thoughts on that? Because it is a tough topic. That's a really tough topic. And of course, you know, mileage may vary. Everybody has like specific issues they're dealing with. I was talking with someone who is a professor um, and just top researcher on ethics. And he actually has been working with the Catholic Church. Oh my gosh, can you imagine what a tough job that is to be brought in? Because of course, guilty by association. I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a religion, you know? So like to come in and try to help to build trust is tough, especially in a situation like that. So there are people, there are organizations that have institutions that have their work cut out for them, but I think that there are good people. And I think people understand, you know, that not everything is necessarily corrupt, but if you're fighting that fight, you just have to prove your trustworthiness. Do the fast tracking to trust as much as you possibly can. Any other questions? We have one from the... Uh, yes, virtual. Yeah. Woo! Okay. <laughs> and uh, it's about uh, a virtual audience. So do you have a favorite shared experience you may have used before with um, virtual participants in an event you've been on? Mm. Oh my gosh. Um, that's a really good question. I think that, and usually when people say that, they don't mean that. Like they're like, oh God, I don't know. But there was an experience that I was on where they had, kind of like you, they had a person who would come on 
and was talking with the, the virtual community. I was part of that virtual community. And I honestly felt like I was, I mean, and this is not going to make people who have live events feel good, but the person was so good that I felt like there was definitely a community that was building on that particular virtual you know, group. And I had the thought, like, yes, I wish I could be there, but I wanted to, to like, connect with everybody who was in my particular room. And I thought, how can I, how could that happen and be there live at the same time? And I felt truly like I was, it was like bonus that I got to be online and have that, that virtual interaction. But one thing that she did, um, and she was really masterful about, um, and this is the host. This is like the person, this is the gen in this situation. She would bring in the speakers in between, um, like, like I'm up here talking, and then I would go over and sit with Jen, and then Jen would interview me and ask me questions right after I get off the stage as people are shifting and like going into the bathroom and getting drinks and stuff like that. And um, it was the coolest thing because it was like I got my own like little special show that nobody else did. And everybody who was in there, we did, we did end up exchanging like emails and stuff. And it was, it was like we really were creating relationships in that room. So that was probably the best virtual experience. I mean, it wasn't like a, the example of a mariachi band, but it was cool. A cool comment um, along those lines, somebody saying at a recent conference, they had a special app designed just for attendees. Um, and the app was sent out ahead of time. Uh, so they posted to the feed before and during. Um, they did prizes for most posts, best quality posts, et cetera. And in the end, everybody agreed they wanted the app to stay live all the time. So, yeah. A good point. Yeah, well, you always hope for that. I mean, you know, one thing that somebody asked me is, how do you know? Um, and this is previous. I was talking about this and really thinking about this particular talk today because Usually what I get, uh, like what I end up presenting on is I end up presenting on how to build social media strategies or how to build a podcast marketing strategy. It's not talking about community, which I hope by now you probably can tell I feel very passionate about. And so I was talking about this a lot leading up to today. And one of the things somebody asked me was they said, well, how do you know if there's, if there's somebody who's online, they're participating, um, you know, how do you know if you're actually building real engagement where they care or you've, or you've, you've, you've established something, you know that something is, is compelling to somebody? Um, and I said, well, you know when there's a potential community there, when people come back to you and they ask you for more. So if you put on an event um, online, a virtual summit, if you put on like a webinar, if you, if you do an interview online, and then you have people contact you afterwards, and they say, they, they seek out your name. This is especially true if you don't know who this person is, right? If people seek out how to contact you specifically to tell you, please tell me when you do something like this again, or it might sound like, I'm so glad I found this thing. Please put me on your list. Or I signed up. That, hold on to that. Because that's a sign that you're on to something that people think of as, this is, I want to make sure, I want to go out of my way that I don't miss any of this material again. You know, And that's a sign that there, you've probably got something that you can build around. All right. OK, do we feel good? You want mariachi music, I know, I know. <laughs> Um, you always remember, support, and protect who or what helps you belong. And I hope that you feel like you belong today. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, Kiki. Um, that was wonderful. Thanks, Thanks so much. Um, what really was apparent to me was how important it is to have community as a foundation, in this case, what we're going to be talking about the rest of the day. It's all about trust and relationships, and that's ideal. It was ideal to have Kiki start us off, because from now on, 
the events that we're going to talk about and the processes and the production are all manifestations, really, of the success that you have within your community and building that trust. So um, the other thing that I took from it was we, we tend to think of an event by event mentality. We all get ready for an event. We have the event. It's over. And then we go into something different. And it seems to be much more fluid than that, that an event like this and webinars and live stream programs or whatever it might be are manifestations of the community. They're integrated within the community. And they, and they uh, leverage each interaction. And in between these opportunities, there's conversation and engagement and building of trust. So I think that was perfect. Thank you so much, Kiki. I think we're going to take a quick break, right? And then we'll come back together and talk about virtual event design. Thank you. Another hand for Kiki. Yeah.